beginning One with God the Lord most high Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you our Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name
Lord is more powerful than politics. He's more powerful than nature. He is all things forever and ever. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of worship. We, we thank you for being the most powerful force in the universe who created us with such love that you actually came to die for us here on this earth and give us an opportunity to be with you forever. We thank you for that, Father. I endlessly thank you. We pray that you would be honored in this worship time. Please be with us, fill us, renew us. And in your name we pray. Amen. This is Amazing Grace, friends. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? such a great song. Great clapping, everyone. Welcome to worship today. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Road to Emmaus Presbyterian Church, where we have a heart for the Harrisburg area and make new and growing disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, In the chair backs in front of you, uh, we have a visitor's card and a prayer card. If you're visiting with us today, please fill that out. You can put it in the offering box on your way out, and we'll get to know you better. Uh, During our prayer time, um, if you don't feel comfortable giving up prayer to Pastor Wayne, 
you can fill out a prayer card and we'll make sure those prayers are, are uh, given. And for those of you watching online, we welcome you. Feel free to email or contact the church and we will uh, assist you with your prayers or concerns. Uh, <clears throat> we talked last week, um, Aaron is doing a Bible study on Wednesday nights at seven o'clock, one at a time. And there's a story in here I wanna share with you about Mother Teresa, if you don't mind. I recently read a story in which Mother Teresa was in Australia and came across an elderly man who lived in absolute squalor. Mother Teresa wrote, I can assure you that you now have no idea seeing a situation as difficult as this poor old man's. I imagine myself in that situation, and I'm pretty sure I would feel incapable of helping. But Mother Teresa, she told the man she was going to clean his house, wash his clothes, and make his bed. He said no, but her insistence overcame his refusal. While cleaning the house, Mother Teresa discovered a lamp covered with dust. She asked the man, don't you light your lamp? Don't you ever use it? He answered, no, no one comes to see me. I have no need to light it. Who would I light it for? She asked him if he would light it if the local nuns came to visit. He replied, of course. That day, the local nuns, nuns committed to visiting him every evening. Two years later, Mother Teresa said she had completely forgotten that man until we received a message from him. Tell my friend that the light she lit in my life continues to shine still. I get that using Mother Teresa as an example to follow of loving people one at a time seems a little out of reach. But what strikes me about that story and many others I've read about her is the fact that the something she did was usually something we could do. She didn't write this man a huge check or perform a complicated surgery. She made his bed and washed his clothes. Please join me to call worship. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Be gracious to me, O Lord. Seize my affliction. O you, lift me up from the gates of death. Those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. In the gates of your city, I will count all your praises, that I may rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk in the pit that they made, in the net that they hid. Their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. Arise, O Lord. Let not the wicked prevail. O Lord, let the nations know that they are but men. Now please stand as we sing How Firm a Foundation. It can be found in the Blue Hymnal, page 361 or on the screen.
All of us have faltered before the storms that seem ready to destroy us. Life storms overwhelm us and fear takes a deadly toll. Sometimes we are snared in the work of our own hands. We forget the greatest source of hope and help, help and hope. In these moments together, we lay aside our doubts and fear of destruction to open our lives to God and the flourishing he brings to our lives. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Help us, O oh God, we do not have the wisdom to help ourselves, and the good we have tried to create crumbles beneath our feet. We become here in hopelessness and pity. We are desperately stuck, and we need you. We cannot hide from the evil that's all around us. We cry out for your saving mercy, because some of it is also in us. We confess that it is easier to see the problems and the promise. We have been more ready to complain, accept your help. Open our hearts to you. We want to be healed. Amen. God has listened to us, despite all that we have done or not done. God accepts us. This is the day of salvation when brokenness is mended, problems are seen in the light of your providence, and fierce winds are still. God does not forget the cry of the afflicted. God's affection for us is limited only by our failure to respond. Accept the gifts of God's love, for it is everything we need. Please remain standing and we'll sing No Longer Slaves.
Please be seated. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Jesus calms the storm. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down. It was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? You still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. To God. Thanks be to God. Got all, all the guys today. Boys day today. Yeah. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Good to see you guys today. I have brought something for you to see, but before I do that, I wanted to show you a couple of things. Um, I wanted to show you a picture of this instrument right here. Have you seen that before, Zach? Have you ever seen a, an instrument like this before? How about you, Zach? I think that's a no. Okay, so this instrument is called a m it's called a mabira, M B I R A. Sorry, growing up, so I didn't think ahead enough to put one up on the screen for you. Um, it's a little bit like a thumb piano, and it's originally based in the country of of uh, Zimbabwe. I'm going to show you. If you've seen has one like this. So um, here is a map of Zimbabwe. It is a country in southern uh, t sort of tip of Africa, not quite South Africa, but Jaden, here's where Zimbabwe is. You can open your eyes slightly more than that. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the reason I, I bring that up is because I'm going to show you a version of that, but I want to just talk with you a little bit about um, a place in the Bible that talks about all the world's countries making music. This mabira, this thumb piano, is a musical instrument. And in Psalm 100, the Lord's word says, Shout for joy, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. And so I always think that it's amazing to look at the different musical instruments from around the world um, because I know that people around the world have been making music because God made us to enjoy music and to make music. So this is actually Jaden's. Um, this is a kalimba, which is a westernized version of uh, this other instrument called a mabira. It's westernized because it has more notes, more of the western scale that we're used to using. And Jaden, why don't you show uh, the kids how it's played? So there are different numbers on the notes, and when you hit one, it makes music. Just one all the way to uh, getting to the. This is a this is a seventeen. Yes, I uh, it goes from one to seventeen and. There are many notes and I don't know which one is which. It's okay. It's not a test. It's okay. So I I bring this to you and I'm gonna uh, let Jaden bring it back to the kids room for those who want to play it. You hold on just one second. Um, sorry. Um, I bring this because we are all an instrument that is capable of praising the Lord in our voice and in our way. You know, you see us up front playing music all the time, but every one of us is capable of making a joyful noise to the Lord. And just like the kalimba has lots of different um, different notes on it, different octaves and things like that. Each of us brings a different tone, a different timbre, and a different beauty to worship. And so every time, if you don't think of yourself as someone who sings very well, and I, I know that you're pretty musical already. No, he says no. I know he has some musical gifts. Some of us feel like we may be more naturally gifted than others, but that doesn't matter. The Lord made you. It says in his word, he made all of us, and we are his people. So make a joyful noise unto the Lord this day and every day. Let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty that is music. Sometimes that is music is just wind through the trees. Sometimes it's the sound of a bullfrog. Sometimes it's the sound of a bird. Father, sometimes it's just the sound of the voice of someone we love coming into the home. We thank you, Father, that it is your voice that we hear when we hear beautiful music. And we ask that you would fill us with your peace and with your spirit that we might make a joyful noise our whole lives to you. And in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mrs. Lowe. I'm just looking for my clicker. There it is. Found it. So we are uh, starting a new little series today, and you'll discover what that is all about here in just a minute. But uh, we're going to pray back to back here. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thanks for today. Thank you for our time together in your word. We ask, Lord, today that you would help us to see something new about your intentions to change our lives, to transform us, and uh, in the very specific way that we'll be thinking about that today. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we could uh, all ask our questions. I think we should do this on a regular basis to kind of evaluate why our backsides are in these particular seats on this particular day, in this hour. Why are we here? What are we doing here? What is the purpose of our gathering? What is the, this time together intended for? Uh, I know that uh, over the course of our lives, that has been for different reasons. When we were children, our parents probably said, get in the car, we're going to church. You ever had that happen to you? Or those words ever come out of your mouth? Uh, that is the case. Uh, or perhaps someone promised you lunch after worship. That had been a previously uh, big motivator in my life as a kid. There might be McDonald's or something like that after church, and that was very exciting. But I hope that uh, you are here today because you're longing for something deeper, something uh, more um, uh, substantial to make sense of your living. That is one of the reasons why we should come to a place like this to hear from the Lord and to allow him to do his work in our lives so that we more and more might become the people, the beautiful creation that we have been made to be, very much like what Rebecca was just saying to the kids. Uh, but uh, even as that is true, there might be something happening in your life. Like the other night, you watched the presidential debate. <laughs> and you're, you're longing for some peace, some, something that, uh, that will make sense of the world around us. Uh, you're longing for some, quest, some, some answer to the questions that uh, those kinds of events uh, make us qu ask. Uh, perhaps you're searching for some peace, some rest, some mercy, not just for your life, but for the world. Uh, Rebecca and I were on vacation a couple of weeks ago uh, up to the Adirondacks, and uh, we had Jaden with us, and uh, we decided one night we'd go to the movies. We went to go see Inside Out 2, Inside Out 2, uh, one of these movies by Pixar. Uh, both the first and the second version, they're very interesting movies. So they're entertaining. Uh, but what they do is they sort of try to take a look inside the mind of a young girl. Her name is Riley, uh, and the movies are, are telling the story of the emotions as they grow and develop inside her. Now, Riley is a girl who tends to be a rather happy person, and so joy, the emotion joy, is often at the controls, and they, they envision this room inside her brain where there's a control panel, and joy is often pressing the buttons and moving the levers to uh, help her to navigate her life. But there are others that are in the room as well. There is sadness and anger and fear and disgust. That's the, what we see in the first movie. As we come to the second movie, there's this little blinking light on the panel, on the control panel, and it starts blinking. They'd never seen it before, and they look closely at it, and it's labeled puberty. And so with that, there's this whole new thing that is happening in the mind of this girl, and to those emotions, there are now a whole new set of emotions that are coming along, most importantly, embarrassment and anxiety. And uh, we learn how, over the course of the movie, how she integrates these new things into the living of her life. And uh, without spoiling the, motion, the, the movie too much for you, even as an adult, I think it's a great movie to go see, uh, we see how in 
um, a certain set of circumstances in her life, anxiety is allowed to take control and what happens there. Enough said about that. Go see the movie. I think it's cute and fun and instructive. But all of this is to say that it struck a nerve with me. And I was thinking to myself as a pastor of a church, I believe that God is, is calling me to say something about this. The way that, that anxiety and fear and worry can sometimes take control of the helm of our lives. And so today and over a couple of more weeks, we're going to explore some Bible passages in which people are fearful or anxious or worried and try to discover how it is that God enters into those things and dispels them, dispels that fear. And so before we uh, go to unpack today's Bible reading, let me ask you another question. Uh, and that is, if, if God were to be at work to change something inside you today, what would you want him to change? What would you want God to be at work to change in you today? Now, oftentimes when I answer sort of off the top of my head, my quick answers tend to be things like, uh, you know, I want peace for the world. I want happiness in my family. I want a full bank account. You know, these kinds of things. But my quick answers tend to focus on things that are not inside me. They are outside me. Uh, not to say those things are bad. We do hope for peace in the world. Uh, we do hope for prosperity. We do hope for healthy families, of course. Those are not bad things. Uh, but when God comes to us with his love, when he um, chooses us in his sovereign grace, and, and we begin to see uh, with our heart and our mind that choosing of us and and we choose in, in fact to respond to that grace with our lives the first order of business is to change our insides to change our heart and our mind something's going to change when god's grace and mercy enters in something is going to change now the reason why god endeavors to do that is that the reality of our sin is the cause of our fear. So let's try to unpack that a little bit. You remember the story of Adam and Eve. Everything's good. You know, Adam and Eve, they're hanging out with God in the garden. There's work to do. There's the beauty. There's full provision. Everything is fine. Of course, there's the one rule. The one rule is to trust God to define good and evil. Just do what God designs and gives, and everything will be fine. But if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil then you shall die. And so, of course, it's hard to keep the one rule right. As soon as there is the rule, we have this fascination with breaking it. And so what happens as they engage in that rebellion against God's command is that fear enters in. Let's take a look at how that happens in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve had eaten of the apple already. They had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They heard then the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Normally, they would have been, yeah, God is here and gonna hang out with God. Or actually, God is always there. But, but now they sense his presence and what do they do? The man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called out to the man saying, where are you? course he knows where they are right but he's calling them to reveal themselves to him and he Adam said I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I'm ashamed of my nakedness and I hid myself and so with that sin we see fear entering into and shame entering into the lives of Adam and Eve and they desperately do things desperately, you know, thoughtlessly, uh, impossibly, to try to hide themselves from the Lord God, to cover themselves somehow, to, to create for themselves some sort of safety and security. Now, so that is sort of the beginning of the unfolding story of all of Scripture. What happens as a result of Genesis chapter 3, the entire scripture now tells a story about how God is coming to his people. And there is one particular way that God comes to his people. Let me show you a couple of verses to talk about that. 
to Abraham. Abraham was afraid that God's promise would not come. What does God say? Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield, and your reward will be very great. In Joshua, as he's leading people into the promised land, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for I am with you wherever you go. In the Psalms, Psalm 46, one of many Psalms we could point to, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though all kinds of climatic things, not climatic, climactic, climatic. Well, you know what I mean. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 41, the prophet says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my hand. Jesus says, in Matthew chapter 10, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, for you are of great value. You are of more value than many sparrows. Uh, in uh, 1 John chapter 4, the apostle John says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And wherever fear uh, fears and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Now, so this is a long spattering of another maybe 30 or 40 verses that we could have looked at that talk about, do not fear, for I am with you. And so as Jesus comes to us, as God fully reveals himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit comes to transform our lives and in one particular very important way, that we would be less afraid, that we would be less anxious, that we would be less fearful. If uh, you're here today because someone told you to get into the car, you're not alone. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus said to the disciples, get in the boat. They got in the boat. Get in the boat. It's, it's time to go. That's uh, a bit of a paraphrase. But in uh, 35 here, it says, let us go across to the other side. And so they left the crowd. It was a busy day. The crowds were great. And, and it was time to try to move beyond the crowds to find some respite, some quiet, and some peace. Now, it was difficult, of course, because there were other boats that were following along. And uh, finally, we get to 37, and we discover that a great windstorm rises up upon them, and it beats against the boat, and so it was already beginning to sink. So these storms, apparently, out on the Sea of Galilee, they, they pop up quickly. They're very sudden, and they can do quite a lot of damage. Panic is overwhelming the disciples, but... He, Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And so we have to uh, understand what's happening here. The, this is a fairly large fishing vessel uh, that they are accustomed to, the, these sailors, these uh, fishermen rather, are accustomed to using. Uh, but this storm was so big, so strong, that it was already breaking the boat up into pieces. And the boat was already beginning to fill. And in the boat uh, at the rear, at the stern, there was often a special place for non-fishermen to be, you know, where the special guests would be out of the way of the work of the men. And it had a, a cushion or a little rug so that people would be comfortable back there if they were along for the ride. And that's where Jesus is. And so the distinguished guest, the carpenter, is very comfortable, relaxing, in the midst of this storm. Masts are snapping. Sails are tearing. Uh, and these are the professional fishermen. They know how to handle boats in tough circumstances, but it was too much even for them. And finally, they call out to the carpenter. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Because there's... It's more than, hey, could you give us a hand? That would have been one thing. But listen to that question. What do you see there? Do you not care that we're about to die in a pile? Does it not matter to you that we're all going down? It's a question really more about, Lord, do you really care for us? Are you interested in the circumstances of our lives? Are you concerned for our welfare? And I think this is the question we ask in the midst of our grief, of our loss, of our financial struggles, of our heartache, when our family is fighting, when these kinds of things happen, 
and we finally come to the Lord because the masts are snapping, we find ourselves asking this question. Jesus, do you really care about what's going on for me? Well, of course, he wakes up and he rebukes the wind and he says to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind has ceased and there's a great calm. He has the power to still, still the storm. And they say, who is this that even the wind and the waves, uh, he say, they say that in the next verse. But he said to them, why are you so afraid? And the next question should be telling, why have you no faith? So we all know what fear feels like. But what exactly is fear? We, we can have a, a clear sense of, of what it's doing in our lives, or at least how it feels in our lives. But if we were to talk about what exactly fear is, what would we say? Uh, I happened to be uh, offering this message last night to our Egyptian friends. And uh, they often, uh, perhaps like you as well, they, they, they quickly said, well, it's worry or, or anxiety. And th those things are true. We can use that as part of a definition but those are also feelings. Those are also similar things. And so we have to go just a little bit deeper, I think. Uh, we shouldn't simply define the feeling of fear with other feelings as well. We might define it uh, a little more deeply. And I, as I think about this, this is not a Webster's Dictionary definition. I didn't go to the Google to, uh, to find this. It's, it's what I believe is happening underneath. Fear is this feeling or emotion that motivates behavior, but it starts with something else. Fear originates with a thought, a thought that I have in my head, a thought that says I am unprotected, I am at risk, and I am vulnerable. Bad things beyond my control might happen to me. This is fear, I think. And so not only do we have fear, but that fear does something to us. It's not just something that we feel when we are in that spot where I feel vulnerable and unprotected and no one is out there to, to, to protect me. That's what I soon begin to proclaim about myself. In the movie, Inside Out, they talk about core beliefs. And these, when we swim in fear, these core beliefs begin to develop. I have no one to protect me. No one cares about me. I am on my own. And I must do what I need to in order to survive. And when we get to that place, we discover that fear then begins to double down. It doesn't look for help to alleviate that. It doubles down on this reality, and it goes even deeper. Uh, fear doubles down. It reinforces the self-centeredness of sin. You might Think again about a definition of sin. What is sin? Well, think about what's the middle letter of sin. What's the central part of it? It's I. And so when I begin to do what I need to do to get what I think I need, that's when I start to lie. That's when I start to defraud others and compromise their bad name to make me good, look good. That's when I take what does not belong to me. I steal. That's when I am adulterous. I lust over the things that other people have. I covet. And so when I'm fearful and I get to those tough spots, life storms, when they rage, fear starts to do what it must to get what I think I need in order to protect myself. And so you hear a lot about I and me and what I need and what I'm going to get for myself to self-protect in order to somehow get to a point where I'm secure and happy. I claw my way to that place but never get there. So maybe that's something of what you feel today. Maybe it's because the storm is too much for you to handle. Maybe the boat is beginning to sink and take on water. Uh, like the disciples in Mark 4, they call out to Jesus, and that is perhaps the simplest point that this sermon might uh, have for you today. Cry out for Jesus. Cry out for Jesus. Yell at the top of your lungs, Jesus, save me. Ask the question, do you really care about me? I believe you will get an answer. And I believe we need to ask, 
like the disciples did, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey? And when we find that that calm begins to come upon our storms, it's time to offer ourselves in gratitude for all that Jesus does. So when we come to Jesus, we discover that we come to the only one who can truly cover us with his presence. And that's a a very biblical kind of image. Uh, Just a little bit here from the Psalms about this. There's a great song that I think we're going to sing next week. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust, he will deliver you from the snare and from the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge his faithfulness is a shield and a buckler you will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrows that fly by day Uh, but there's also something we have to recognize and this is part and parcel of the very beginnings of faith and every day that comes after that beginning is that we have to confess and repent of the fear that we have clung to instead of clinging to Jesus. Because our fear is a fundamental mistrust of God's care, direction, provision for our lives. And so when we repent of that, it's not simply being sorry for that, but more importantly, it is stepping into the confidence. It's stepping into the courage that can only be sourced from the God who saves us, the God who loves us, the God who makes us and understands us. It's stepping into that courage that is not afraid. It's stepping into that confidence that is unworried about the storms that rage in the world. That is our repentance, even as the storms may rage. So thinking about those core beliefs for just a moment, uh, again, if you see the movie sometime, again, I encourage you to do so, you'll see at the end that there's this new set of core beliefs that form for the the preteen girl, Riley. And it's integrating all of these realities that she is now beginning to experience of herself. And I think it's important for us to maybe think about that as well. What are our core realities, core realities, our our core uh, beliefs as children of God? As children of God, one of those core beliefs, I hope, is true for you, is that you are never alone. You are never alone. You never have to simply fend for yourself because God, the one who makes us and loves us, who shows us mercy and grace, he cares for us and protects us. Now, the storms may still rage, of course, but we have this fundamental promise that even at the very end of the age, we will fully be cared for in eternal life. That itself gives us a new courage to face the storms. We are the precious children of the king of the universe. We're not simply some grain of the sand, grain of sand on the cosmic beach. You're not simply the blip on the timeline of infinity. You are a precious child of the king of the universe. And finally this, therefore, for these reasons, we will not fear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for today. We thank you for these promises that are replete through the scriptures. We can hardly uh, not bump into them uh, just by random reading. And so we thank you that in your word you show us your great care and love and mercy for us. Therefore, we will not fear. Thank you, Jesus, for this, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. A song today for uh, our reflection after the sermon, Be Still My Soul.
Let's confirm our faith together today using the words from our essential tenets. Although we are each deserving of God's eternal condemnation, the eternal Son assumed our human nature, offering himself on the cross in order to free us from slavery to death and sin. Jesus takes our place in bearing the weight of condemnation against our sin. On the cross, he offered the perfect obedience that humanity owes to God, but is no longer able to give. Those who are united through faith with Jesus Christ are fully forgiven from all our sin, so that there is indeed a new creation. We are declared justified, not because of any good that we have done, but only because of God's grace extended to us in Jesus Christ. In union with Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are brought into right relation with the Father, who receives us as his adopted children. Jesus Christ is the only way to this adoption, the sole path by which sinners become children of God. Thank you, friends. Please be seated. All right, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together today. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God who comes to step into uh, the midst of our worry and fear, our anxiety, and you call us to faith in you, to trust your sovereignty and your mercy and your love, your care and protection in our lives. We ask, Lord, today that we may not be distracted by the wind and the waves, but we might look ever more... Um, uh, intently upon you, that we would give ourselves more and more intently to your care and mercy in our lives. And so, Lord, we, we pray that in the midst of a confusing world where there are indeed storms, that uh, you would uh, call us more and more to yourself and that we might respond with more and more vigor and gladness and intention. And indeed, that we might proclaim changed lives to the world around us, to invite others in to this place of peace and grace, where we are the family of God. We thank you for this beautiful promise and its beautiful fulfillment, even here among us right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, today we pray for our friend Patrick and ask, Lord, that he's struggling with some shoulder pain, that you would uh, help his doctors to understand what's happening, and that uh, he might uh, take some rest, uh, perhaps, to let the, that shoulder uh, recover. Uh, and if there's uh, some surgery or some procedure that needs to, to happen, Lord, we pray that that might happen swiftly and that recovery might happen uh, well. 
We ask, Lord, today that you would be with Lulu as she is uh, recovering from uh, a shark attack, uh, such a traumatic event, uh, and ask, Lord, today that you would uh, help to heal not only her body but her spirits and emotions as, as uh, that has to have been uh, a terrible experience to have happen. We ask, Lord, that you'd be with the, uh, the Ulri and Hanawald family today, that you would bless them in the midst of their loss. We thank you, Lord, for Jim's life and ask, Lord, that, um, that he would serve for us as an example of a life well-lived, of deep faith, of great courage. So, Lord, thank you for Jim. And I thank you, Lord, that he is received well into his eternal home in which he hears your voice say, well done, good and faithful servant. We ask, Lord, today that you would be with Stephen as he gets married next Saturday. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to his life, speak to him wisdom about how to be a good husband, teach him those things that he does not yet know. And I ask, Lord, today that uh, there would be um, a firm foundation that undergirds him even before he seeks it out. Make yourself known to him and his fiance, Lord, we pray, and teach them the ways of healthy marriage. Lord, in, in a brief moment of quiet, we just breathe deeply of your presence among us and we receive you again. Change us again, Lord, we pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time and this place, for these people and your presence. And we pray these things as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, let's uh, stand and sing a last song.
Please be seated. Uh, and I think we have announcements at the end. If we could have a few of those slides, please. Uh, some things for our ministry in the days and weeks ahead. Of course, always prayer. If you'd like a moment of prayer right after worship today, I'd be happy to pray with you. Saturday mornings also, 8.30. Saturday morning, uh, there's a time of prayer, about a half hour, 45 minutes together. Also, if uh, anyone is interested in becoming a member, covenant partner here at Road to Emmaus, I'd be happy to talk with you and lead you through that process. We have uh, the next installment of One at a Time, the, the book that Barry referenced early in our service today. Our next gathering will not be on June 26. It'll be on July 10. Uh, that'll be a week from Wednesday because Wednesday is fireworks at Coons Park. And so uh, we're going to be gathering there at Coons Park. Uh, I'll be there at 7 o'clock, probably actually even a little earlier to try to uh, plant our flag and grab our spot on the lawn there. Um, and um, please be aware that parking is difficult there. And so if you'd like to get a park, a, a spot close, come earlier. We'll be by the tennis courts. Um, but also be aware if you do that, you're going to be there late because it'll be a long time to get out as well. Uh, so uh, think about that. Hmm? Carpooling. You could ride with me if you want. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the mission trip that had been planned to northern Delaware, we've had to kind of put that on hold for now. But that being said, on um, July the, let's see, what is it? Uh, 13th. Thank you. July the 13th, uh, the Bears, Doug and Cindy, are going to lead us to serve core. Uh, in Allison Hill. So uh, we're going to have a couple of those Saturdays uh, as our mission project for the summer. And so just keep your ear to the ground regarding that. Uh, any questions or announcements that I've missed? We'll see Aaron next week. Today was a special Sunday at his home church uh, out in Spring Run, and so he couldn't be with us today. All right, then if you'd please stand. Let's... Uh, uh, Quite our hearts and minds to receive the Lord's blessing. If you are comfortable doing so, please extend your hands, close your eyes. Hear from the Lord. May the grace of God, the God of peace, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, may he make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight. All of this, the peace of Jesus Christ, his calm, his courage, his confidence. May that be yours today, and may God have all the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace, friends. <laughs>